So uh, I'm going to pick it up in Genesis 28, verse 11. It says, So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night, because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head, and he lay down in that place to sleep. And then he dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Verse 16, Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me, and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I have set as a pillar, shall be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Uh, there's about we got about halfway through that when we finished this morning because we actually started way back in the 27th chapter and was able to come all the way that far. Won't repeat some of the things uh, that we studied this morning, but we will try and emphasize this God's faithfulness in this dream that is given. Now remember what's happening. Jacob is is. Uh, been commanded by his parents to travel to where family is at, his mama's family. Uh, he is going to be going from Beersheba, and he's going to be going to Haran. 500 miles, folks. That's a long way on foot by yourself. He's 77 years old. He's not a young kid, uh, though sometimes we think of him. It appears to be the first time far away from home. Uh, he is certainly a capable man, but he's all by himself. And you remember he, he did things in a way that he shouldn't have. He tried to give God a hand when it came to God's promises and he used deception. And God will never use lying, cheating, stealing to accomplish his holy purpose in your life. The Holy Spirit is holy. And he does not lie, and he does not steal, and he does not cheat. He does not cut corners. He is not a deceiver. He does not use deception. But Jacob, remember, because of, of uh, desiring that blessing, he cut corners. His mom helped him to do it. Now he has to flee. Esau, of course, is so mad, he threatens to kill him. They believe that their father, or he, Esau believes that his dad will die soon because his dad thought he was going to die soon. Remember, he's 137 years old and he's blind. Turns out he's going to live 43 more years. <laughs> he's going to be 180. So you never know how long you have on this earth. But now uh, there is this deliberate sending out. Uh, Rebecca wanted to make sure that Esau did not kill Jacob, so she's trying to figure out where do we send him and why do we send him and what am I going to tell my husband? And she says, you know, if he marries one of these local girls, I'll, it, it's just going to tear my heart out. We've had so many problems with Esau. He, uh, he deliberately picks out women that uh, he's not supposed to. Uh, those who worship other gods, uh, those who, who, who don't hold the same values, don't have the same morals. 
you know, that, that we have. I'm afraid now Jacob's going to find one of these local, you know, women of, of Heth. You might have in your translation Hittite. Um, and uh, so let's send them back to my family and there select uh, the right kind of wife. And then he can come back. Well, you know, Isaac th thinks that's a good idea. And under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he blesses uh, Jacob. Uh, Jacob is the one that God said that the blessing would go through. And so that's why one of the titles for God, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Still use that title today. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Promise that's given unto Abraham, unto Isaac, unto Jacob, as far as the land of Canaan that has been given unto them, as far as the prophecy that there, there will be a, a nation, a mighty nation that will come forth from them, so many descendants that you cannot uh, count them all, and that through their lineage, there's going to come an individual who will bless all the families of the earth. And, of course, that's the Messiah of Israel. That's the Savior of the world. We know that to be Jesus Christ. And so you and I have been on the receiving end of that. We've been on the receiving end. Now, we have nothing to do with any of the land that they've promised, but we have everything to do with the salvation that has been promised in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of our sins, eternal life, the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, heaven being our home. Salvation is very real. The same Jesus that we're studying in the Word is right here, present in this room, desiring to have fellowship with you, to touch you, to bless you, to encourage you, so that we're always different when we leave a gathering like this than when we came in. Jesus is the one who makes all that difference. Well, the promise, as God had prophesied, was coming through the younger son, through Jacob. And Jacob thought that he had to help God out to fulfill his promises. You don't have to help fulfill. What is required of us is to have open hearts, tender hearts. We want to be taught of God. We desire uh, to know his word. We're willing to do his will. Uh, cooperation is what God's looking for that we want to draw close to him, we want to work with him, not against him, want to draw close to him rather than run away. It's that hard attitude that is so important to the Lord. God doesn't need any changing. I need changing. You need changing. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what a challenge he has because look what he's got to work with. He's got folks like you and I around these tables tonight, and he's up to the challenge. Holy Almighty God delights in living his life in and through you, molding and shaping you into his image, pouring out his Holy Spirit upon you, blessing you, encouraging you, and being with you as you're on this journey of life. Well, Jacob is discovering some things. Uh, he, gets, he's, he has his first day journey, and it's a pretty good day. He's got down the road pretty good. He's tired. He's all by himself. He's not within the city. There's a, there's a near little town called Luz. He's outside of that. Uh, and there he looks for a place to sleep. And you know you're kind of in rough times when the best thing you can find for a pillow is a rock. But he takes a, takes a rock and, and that's a pillow. And so he's going to go to sleep. And he's certainly very tired. Uh, we are very helpless when we are asleep. That's when we are most open for attack. Uh, God made it very clear that he was watching over Jacob. You know, you and I, the reason that we can sleep is because God never sleeps. God's ever there. We, we commit our days and our nights into the Lord's hands, don't we? I think a lot of us probably go to sleep talking things over with Jesus, asking for his guidance and direction. I know many live within houses now and doors can be locked, but if you've ever been by yourself out in the woods, it's kind of a unique feeling. I only have a couple weeks worth of that, one week and then a few other little times, one and two days at a time, by yourself out there in the middle of nowhere, uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Now, I didn't just get tossed into that. I didn't go up by myself until I'd already done that several years with groups. I was familiar with what was, but I'll just tell you that's a unique situation when it gets dark and uh, things change. And so the, and the critters that are awake during the day are asleep and all the critters that are normally asleep during the day, they come awake at night and there, there's all this movement in the forest and there's all these sounds 
uh, that are there and there's all this you know that, that goes on and to be able to be at peace with God and to go to sleep uh, is something that you have to learn how to do uh, because if not you, you know you, if you can't get enough sleep you're not going to be worth anything I mean you're always going to be awake all night and you're just going to be exhausted so I'll tell you that God does watch over his people during the day and God watches over his people at night and it's right for us to trust him during the day and during the night, not to put ourselves in foolish positions. But you notice here he was being obedient to what his parents had um, commanded him to do uh, and he, he, he was where he was supposed to be. He discovered that God was with him. He didn't know that God was with him. And the way he discovered that is God gives him this dream. And uh, dreams are very personal, aren't they? But he says, I want everybody to know this dream. Well, some of your dreams you might want people to know, and some of your dreams you may not. Right? Dreams are very personal. Sometimes you can figure them out, sometimes you can't. Uh, but here is a dream, and God says, I want my people in every generation to see what you see, Jacob. I want them to hear what you hear, Jacob. I want them to be a part of this dream, and what I teach you in this dream, I want them to learn. So here we are, all of these generations later, and God says, I want you to consider what I showed to Jacob that night, because you will be blessed in what I said to him and what I taught him. So now he is, he's learning how uh, to, to follow the Lord, and it took him decades. Oh, did he struggle. He really struggled. Now remember later, Jacob's name is going to be changed to Israel. But we got 20 years before that happens. And so he, well, this is just kind of the, the process that takes place here. It says, what he saw, it says he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. You might have stairway. You might have the term ladder. But you'll notice it said it was set on the earth, but it reached to heaven. You know, by, by following where that ladder started and where it ended up, his attention is drawn from the things of the earth to the things of heaven. And they're linked. If you only live to, for what's going on on the earth, you're going to miss out on God's best. You know, our attention has to be drawn from the earth and to heaven. From that which is physical to that which is spiritual. That which is temporary to that which is eternal. And so this dream draws his attention from the earth, and it's taken up to heaven, and he sees angels. Some are going up, and some are coming down. And angels are on assignment. They are ministering spirits that sent forth to the heirs of salvation, those who are saved. You have an angel. If you're born again, you have an angel that's been assigned to you to help out behind the scenes. You know, you have a ministry, you have a call. They work in the unseen, you work in the scene. Uh, and they are there. The Holy, just as the Holy Spirit gives us uh, guidance and direction, the Holy Spirit gives guidance and direction to angels. Angels are created beings. They can only be in one place at one time, just like you can only be in one place at one time. If they have been assigned to you on this earth, they can't be in heaven. They can be in communication with heaven, but they can't be in heaven. Uh, they're going to have to stick with you as long as they've been assigned. Every now and then might be a few extra angels have to come, might be something special kind of going on, but angels are very real. Uh, and, and so we really appreciate their help and we really appreciate uh, that God has given them assignments. So they, they are ministering spirits sent forth to the air of salvation for those who are saved. So that tells me as many people as we have in this room, we've got at least that many angels that are in this room at this time. Most of the time they remain in the unseen. We don't see them. We are unaware of their presence. Uh, sometimes when they can be seen, we are told that they look just like people. <laughs> in other words, you know, they're, they're not glowing and walking down the street and got their wings and everything. So, you know, that they just, you know, when they're on assignment, a lot of times they look just like people. It's one reason we treat people with respect and dignity because sometimes it says we've entertained angels unaware that know to later on that they were there on assignment. So Jacob's discovering some things. Angels are real. They come from heaven. He saw some that were returning from their assignments here, some that were coming down. But then at the top of this ladder, uh, he sees the Lord. He sees Jesus. 
and the Lord speaks to him. It says, uh, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. So he, speak, he enters into a covenant, just as he had entered into a covenant with Abraham, and then he entered into that covenant with Isaac. Now he enters into that covenant with Jacob. Because, see, God lasts forever, but generations come and go, don't they? You know, great-grandpa is not around anymore. Grandpa may not be around. Even dad may not be around anymore. But the Lord who is present in their lives is present here at this very moment. And so God's word it goes from one generation to the next, remains the same. There's wonderful truths and promises that were spoken a long time, here, uh, a long time ago, but they are still in effect today, especially for the nation of Israel. It says... Uh, he enters in this covenant. He promises the land, the land of Canaan that had been promised to Abraham, promised to Isaac, is now promised to Jacob. It's passed on. Uh, he prophesies that there's going to be a lot of descendants. He says, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And that particular portion of the covenant is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And you and I get to benefit uh, from that, not just folks who are descendants uh, of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, not just folks who are Jewish, because most of us, we have pagan backgrounds, we have Gentile backgrounds, but the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of the Lord, is for Gentiles just like it is for folks who are Jewish, that in there, there is a blessing. So then God promises his presence. He says, I'm going to be with you all of your life. The promise of God's presence. He didn't know that God had been watching over him. He didn't know that God was present. God had to break through. God had to reveal that that's what was going on. I don't know if you can remember the first time you, you discovered that God knew your name, where you lived, and he was active in your life. That God was watching over you. I tell you that God is watching over you. Desires to have fellowship with you. Desires to guide and direct you by his Holy Spirit. He says, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I have spoken to you. Uh, the, the promises that God renews from generation to generation, that I will never leave you nor forsake you, are good. They start are way back in, in Genesis, the book of beginnings. That's still the way it is today. God promising, behold, I am with you. I'm not going to leave you. There is a purpose. I'm going to see you all the way through your ministry. And he prophesies to him that he's going to come back to this same place. Now, if you read ahead, it'll be 20 years before he comes back to this place. It's going to be a while. And when he comes back, he leaves with just what he's got on his back, what he can carry in his pockets, what he's got in his little backpack, but he'll come back as a very wealthy man with a, with a big family. Things are going to be very different 20 years later. But it's still his relationship with the Lord that's going to make all of the difference. So when he has nothing the way he looks at it, God says, I am with you. I'm not going to leave you. I'm, with, I'm watching over you. It says, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. You know, you can't go anywhere on this earth that God's not there. Uh, you, you can dive to, to the lowest points in the oceans, and God is there. You can climb to the highest mountains, and God is there. You can become an astronaut and go ahead and spend some time up in, you know, space station. Hey, you know what? God's there. There's nowhere that you can go that God is not. God is present on this earth. God is present in his universe. God desires that you would have fellowship with him, that you would know him, that you would love him, that, that you, would, you would learn how to cooperate with him. See, God had handpicked and prophesied a ministry for Jacob, and now he's showing the Jacob the way that it needs to be fulfilled. It would have to be by the Spirit rather than in the flesh, and Jacob just insisted on he wanted just to do things in the flesh, so it complicated things. We can't point any fingers at Jacob because we do the same thing. 
We, we, we learn our lessons the hard way, don't we? That, that it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Where we're learning how to walk in the spirit, and we're learning how to live by faith. Once you know the will of God, then it's like, okay, how do we put the will of God into practice? And it's not in our carnal strength and our human strength and what the Bible calls the flesh, all that we are apart from Christ, but it's in setting the flesh aside, set self aside, and every day you take up that cross that Jesus has assigned you, and you do what Jesus says. You follow Jesus. And that's how your life counts for eternity. Set self aside, take up your cross, and follow Jesus every single day. Well, Jacob's just learning these truths. He didn't even know that God was present. And you can see, he didn't quite grasp what was going on. He said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Well, God was in that place, but God is in every place. He thought there was something special about the place. This is a holy place. Well, I'll tell you right now, this is a holy place because Jesus is here. But get us all out of here. There's nothing holy about this place. You see, he thought, it's this place. I have stumbled into the very gate of heaven. I have stumbled into the door of heaven. Well, who is that true ladder to heaven? Who is the true door to heaven? Who's the true stairway to heaven? It's Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is that door by which the sheep come in to be a part of the fold. You see, it's not a place, it's a person. Salvation is not a place, salvation is a person. And Jesus is holy. And in his presence, there is holiness. In his presence, we, we have what, what we're looking for, spirit, soul, and body. And you're not going to find it anywhere else. And it's in a person, not a place. Man, there are folks who are traveling all over. I'm going to go to the holy places, see if I can get in touch with God. You can get in touch with God right here. I can remember years ago that uh, we were with a, a fellow, and uh, he, was, he was down at the White Dove uh, ministry, uh, and Sybil Archer was ministering, and, and it turns out he was headed uh, to see, he was headed to Tulsa, because he was convinced, he says, you know what, the, Jesus does things in Tulsa, Oral Roberts ministry was real big at that time. He said, why, why are you here? Well, I'm headed to Tulsa. When I get there, that's what I'm going to believe. And I remember that she explained, do you understand that Jesus is here in El Paso? And would you believe that Jesus can do for you today in El Paso what you want him to do in Tulsa? And he had never heard that. And so she began to share the word, and God touched that young man. Did, a, did an amazing work, did a healing work in his body. He came to know Christ. And See, he thought that you had to go to a particular place. No, you have to break through to a particular person. And Jacob was just beginning to, to learn those things. He, he didn't know that God was there. And it spooked him. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of the place Bethel. Okay, house of God. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me. In other words, if, if you're telling me the truth, that this dream's real, and he puts all these conditions, and God kind of puts up with this, doesn't he? If God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. He's not quite ready to make a full commitment right now. But he says, if this is real, if you're telling me the truth, and I really do come back here, and all this stuff is for, then I'm going to claim you as my God. Well, it's going to be 20 years before he gets back there, but he'll be a different man. And it says, and this stone which I, I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Well, he understood a little bit about serving God, but the, that terminology there. And there's no law yet. There's just stuff that had been, you know, had been uh, taught from Adam uh, on from generation to generation. And it come then through Noah and had been taught from generation to generation. In, in closing, I want to show you 
a change that takes place when he comes back. Just go to Genesis 35. And in Genesis 35, so it'll take us a, a few more teachings before we get there. But this is when he's going to return to Bethel and he's going to return with all his family. He's going to return, you know, he, he's going to have grown. In Genesis 35, okay, verse 7. Well, let's back it up to 6. Genesis 35, 6. So Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El, Bethel, because there God appeared to him when he fled from the face of his brother. El, Bethel, God of the house of God. See, Bethel is house of God. El is God. He understood now the, the, the emphasis is on God, not on the place. This is El Bethel, God of the house of God. This is where God broke through. This is where God touched my heart. This is where God spoke to me. This is where I know that God was watching over me. He had grown. It wasn't the place. It was the God of the place that was so special. And, and you can, that's what's so wonderful about the Lord, is you can serve him right where you're at. Now, it was not necessary for Jacob to put conditions on his fellowship with God. He's just limiting himself. But you kind of understand where he's at, if this is real. If you're really talking to me, if, this, if, I, if I've just not dreamed all this up, if, this, if you're really talking to me, and you really do bring me back, then I'm going to claim you as my God. Well, it will be 20 years later. God will keep his word. Everything that he says will be fulfilled. We've run out of time, so let's close in prayer. What's that? It's all wrong. As far as what he promised? Yeah. Yeah, I'm in complete agreement with that. You and I can embrace God right now. There is absolutely no way to wait around to do that. That just shows how merciful and gracious God is, isn't it? Yeah, that God is just, there is no need to wait. When God breaks through, that's the day of salvation, isn't it? Today is the day of salvation. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. You never want to put limitations on God and try and make deals with God. That was a big hurdle in Jacob's life. It's going to take him decades to get victory over that. And he's going to have to learn some tough lessons. In other words, what he has sowed, then he reaps. Because he had deceived others, he himself is going to be deceived. But through this whole process, God is going to be present. God is greater than the messes that he got himself into. There is no need to make deals with God. Our salvation is on the basis of grace and mercy, and we can embrace him. Once God breaks through, that's the time to settle things with the Lord. From that day every day, let's have fellowship with the Lord. God's not going to be our God 20 years from now. God is our God right now. He has broke through. We don't wait 20 years to serve him. We serve him every day that he gives us an opportunity. Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for your kindness to us. And Lord, we, uh, we appreciate your grace and mercy. So we place ourselves in your hands, ask for your guidance and direction for this coming week. You know this week, help us to know what's right. Give us the power to do it and to do it with the right heart attitude. Thank you for your kindness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.